Greetings, my brothers and sisters of Tartaria. Welcome to Quest for Tartaria. Hey guys, check this out. I found a, a Scythian map about their migration. Now, you guys might recall uh, the Scythians are the Israelites when they were conquered by Assyria and they were exiled and they became the Scythians. You also might recall that uh, the Scythians became the Tartarians. All right, right here, the Scythians, what we call the Scythians, the intelligible meaning. And Hebrew, special connection with the history of Israel. Right there, guys, the Scythians. Sakai, the Persian name for the Scythians, has also an intelligible meaning in the language and history of the Israelites. It accords with the name uh, applied to the ten tribes of Israel and the country where a large body of them dwelt. Uh, Viz Armenia, called uh, Kassassina, um, Accords with the position of the captive tribes of Israel and the rock uh, records of India and records of the Sakai are intelligible in Hebrew by translation and from the uh, frequent allusions of the tribe of Dan and uh, Nithimius and Gatai and the Goths. Western Scythia has been shown to have been called Sagathi and the ten tribes are stated upon, um, upon Jewish authority to have crossed the Tartary and called themselves Galthai or Galtai. The evidence of the tombstones in the in the Crimea and early Saxon beliefs in the uh, distance of the princes through Wooden from the Jewish patriarch. Well, this map is really cool because it actually shows the um, their migration uh, from. Uh, Samaria and Jerusalem all the way up past Nineveh, Media, Tigris and the Euphrates River so they cross the Euphrates up Media um, you see right that's where they branch right here some come um, come this way and into Europe and then woo, 600 BC to 50 BC and then they work their way up and then become Tartarians up here and it was interesting, you guys also might recall some of the information on uh, on the uh, Tartarians being the Scythians and stuff like that. Giles Fletcher the Elder argued that the Tartars were Jews, although no longer divided into tribes. As evidence, he pointed to some similarities between Tartar and Hebrew languages, the common practice of circumcision, and the fact that the Tartars had a fort named Mount Tabor. Check it out, guys. All right, with that being covered... Let's go ahead and um, get further into this. Okay, so Tartaria obviously was the old world order. Um, Genghis, as you might recall, Genghis Khan took over Tartaria or took over the world. Excuse me, uh, between the year one thousand and eleven hundred. By the year eleven hundred, uh, the world was under Tartaria control. The last places he conquered. So a little recap: he conquers China, India. Arabia, and then even and even kills the prophet Muhammad, um, goes into Egypt, takes out Egypt, then liberates Africa of Egypt, and then goes in and attacks Europe, which is really interesting. So a lot was going on uh, back then, but this also fulfills Bible prophecy that the bloodline of Israel would be would bless the whole earth, which is really interesting. We'll get into some. Bible study stuff, which will be awesome. Uh, we'll be able to link it all together, make sure that make the Bible true. But what makes that fantastic, guys, after you learn this from the Bible, you'll learn that we are Israel. Fourth, they are the greatest military powers. Jeremiah 51, verse 20 gives God's word. Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war. For with thee will I break in pieces the nations, and with thee will I destroy kingdoms. Throughout history, this has been true. Two centuries after being taken captive by Assyria, the peoples of Israel, who were then generally known as Scythians, had bled Assyria white by their constant warfare against it, so that Assyria was an easy pushover victory for the Medes and Persians just before they turned their attention to Babylon. It was the Israel tribes on their march into Europe being then called the Visigoths, Ostrogoths, and Vandals, who crushed the Roman Empire. 
the peoples of Anglo-Saxon Israel defeated Russia under the Tsars, destroyed the great empires of Spain and Japan, and conquered Turkey and Italy. Not without heavy cost, of course, for the promises of easy victory were among the promises made through Moses, and these were conditional upon keeping the law. But the promise of final victory so great that the enemy is shattered, even though the cost be heavy, this promise is unconditional, and it has been consistently fulfilled to only one people, those whom we identify as Israel. In Isaiah 49, verse 8, God says, Thus saith the Lord, In an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in a day of salvation have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth, to cause to inherit the desolate heritages. No one else has so successfully developed the colonies which were desolate when they were first occupied as have these people. They have expanded in colonies in all directions. Deuteronomy 3 verse 8 says, When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. Genesis 28 verse 14 says, Thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east, and to the north and to the south, and in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Isaiah 54 verses 2 and 3 tells us, Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes, for thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the nations, and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Their colonies were established in every sea, in Europe, North and South America, Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and Asia. Who else ever had such colonies? They have maintained the continuity of the throne of David. David's descendants continued on the throne in Jerusalem until King Zedekiah was taken prisoner to Babylon, at which time all of his sons were slain. But the prophet Jeremiah took the king's daughters first to Egypt, as we read in Jeremiah 43, verse 6, and from there by way of Spain to Ireland, where Zedekiah's daughter, Teatethi, was married to Eochaid, the Heriman, or chief king of Ireland. Eochaid was a descendant of Zara, one of the twin sons of Judah, while David was a descendant of Pharez, the other twin. Killing all of Hezekiah's sons didn't end the dynasty, as it was established law in Israel ever since they first entered Palestine, that when a man died leaving no sons, his daughters received the entire inheritance. The two king lines of the tribe of Judah were united in this marriage, and the lineage is clearly traced in the histories of Ireland, Scotland, and England, unbroken down to the present Queen Elizabeth. Thus the prophecy that David's descendants should always be on the throne over an Israelite nation has been fulfilled, and by the Anglo-Saxon nations only. This has covered but a tiny fraction of the Bible's proof that the Anglo-Saxon, Scandinavian, and Germanic people are the Israel of the Bible. Scholars have found nearly a hundred prophecies concerning Israel which have been fulfilled by this one group of people. When you consider that the United Nations now recognizes more than 100 member nations, the odds against any one nation fulfilling the first of these prophecies is obviously at least 100 to 1. The odds against the same nation fulfilling both the first and second prophecies again multiplies this by 100 making 10,000 to 1, and the odds against the same nation fulfilling the first, second, and third prophecies becomes 1 million to 1, and so forth. Well, you figure it out. Well, so happens we did figure it out, guys. Um, it was the Tartarians, 1100 conquering everything, Africa, liberating Africa from Egypt and stuff like that. And that's why the, in my opinion, that's why the Africans had such um, we'll see, in World War I, the Africans fought for the Germans and even fought to the death because of something that happened in ancient times and they felt like paying them back because, they, you know, it was because Genghis Khan liberated them from the uh, Egyptians. So we know what it is now and it's, you know, it's hidden history. But, um, 
yeah, you know, the Tartarians and Genghis Khan are the what, you know, who were the lost tribes of Israel have fulfilled this and they've become a blessing to all nations. So like everything he's saying about the Anglo-Saxons, Scandinavians and stuff, they didn't know about Tartaria back then. But can you imagine Bernard's, can you just imagine his um, reaction if he learned about Tartaria? I mean, just really imagine it. He would be blown off his feet, fall back in his chair and go, wait, you mean God has concreted his people by blood and by spirit? That means that whites, Asians, blacks, you know, Indians, everybody is brothers and sisters and they're Israel and they've been, they've all been grafted into the, into the children of God, both by blood and by spirit. That's the big secret guys. We're all brothers and sisters. Take care of each other, respect each other, love each other and so forth. But we all need to have each other's back. So we all need to wake up. 144,000 are the ones that are beheaded for the word of their testimony and, and revelation. And those are the ones that Antichrist attacks. And those are the ones that dragons turn on when he can't get to the ones that go to the wilderness. And we'll go over that too. But you guys need to be the ones that go to the wilderness. So be faithful now. Get faithful now. Get a relationship with God now through his son, Jesus Christ. You have to. If you don't and you end up waking up late... You'll be, yes, you'll still be a part of the 144,000. That is, if you don't take the mark of the beast and you don't give in. But yeah, here we'll continue. Keep on multiplying by 100, oh, even 50 more times. But even that isn't all. A group of nations all of the same blood have done this. Not a random assortment like China and Spain or Egypt and Brazil, but all of the same racial group. So this again multiplies the odds. Do you think that all this could have happened by mere accident? And if you do think that this was pure accident, then what has become of God's prophecies and promises? Was God too ignorant to know that he couldn't make good on his word and that all the things he had promised to Israel would never get there but would all be taken by other people? No, I don't think that God made any failures or any mistakes. He promised and prophesied many things about Israel. They have all come to pass, and they have all been made good to the same racial group of nations. This people has Israel's go, fingerprints. Now, remember his information is from a long time ago, but we know Genghis Khan had taken over and conquered the whole world, so we all have Israel's fingerprints. And by 1652, the uh, the Tartarians had all this yellow territory. And I mean, after reading books and stuff, I really understand, you know, that's why they were in the Philippines and stuff. And then uh, I'm pretty sure the blue is places they would given independence to. So they gave their independence to Africa, I'm pretty sure. And then, then the British and all them, they owned Madagascar. And then, you know, down in uh, Australia, I believe, was independent. And then, of course, uh, Britain owned uh, South America. Tartaria owned America, at least the coastline of America, you know, Cuba, Mexico, the Sierra Nevadas. And um, the Quivera re region right here, um, that's on a few maps too. And they actually talk about it. And there's a Spanish explorer that went to try to go to the, there to find the... Um, Tartarus Rex, the king of Tartar in um, in, Af in America. So, yeah. And then, of course, we got the Great Wall of Tartary. <laughs> yeah. We, we went over that, I'm pretty sure, in the last video. Yeah, the defenses of the Great Wall are pointed towards China. So, yeah. Interesting stuff. But, yeah. And then... Up here, these are independent, I believe. And, but, yeah, we're all brothers and sisters because, you know, they did. They took over the earth and, you know, they made the, the world Israel. Because you'll see on this other map, Israel went into Europe and then the Scythians, you know, became the Tartarians and they 
conquered all this land and then conquered Africa and then <clears throat> went into this land again. So that, I mean, and then, you know, we know we see their presence in Australia, Japan, China, and I mean, all over the place. So, and even in America, you can see those, those buildings and stuff, you know, I think we had a, uh, a railroad station in, in New York that was just so elaborate and so big, it was too expensive to maintain, you know, so a lot of stuff. We are Israel, okay? We are Israel. We are the line of Israel too, the tribes of Israel. And because of Tartaria, we are the tribes of Israel. And then after conquering the world, of course, the, um, the auspicious circumstance for the Dr. Ladian's translation of the Jaghatai uh, that Prince Zagathi himself embraced Christianity and made a public profession of the gospel in his capital of Samachiklan. Um, there were, at, there were at that point, above a hundred Christian churches in the province, and some of them remain to this day. We're also informed both by the historian and Romish writers that there was a new version of the New Testament in Psalms in the Tartaria language. Doctor Leyden also soon discovered whether this was the Jihadi, the language is spoken in um, Bakara, Balak, and Samar clan, and other cities of. Uzbek and independent Tartary. This is the country where Dr. Giles Fletcher, who was the envoy of the Queen Elizabeth at the court of the Tsar of Mus Muscovy, has assigned as a principal residence of the descendants of the Ten Tribes. He argues with their place from the names of their cities, from their language, uh, which contains Hebrew and Chaldaic words, and from their particular rites, which are Jewish. The principal city, Samarcha clan, is pronounced Samarchian, uh, which Dr. Fletcher thinks might be a name uh, given by the Israelites after their own um, Samaria and Palestine. See Israel Redux, page 12. Jerusalem of Judea also traveled to the country in the 12th century and afterwards published a itinerary saying, In Samarcha clan, the city of the Tamerlane, there are 50,000 Jews under the presiden presidency of Rabbi Abadia, and in the mountains and cities of Nashbor, there are four tribes of Israel um, residents via Dan, uh, Zebulon, Ashtar, and Naphtali. It is remarked that the people of Zagathi um, should be constantly called Ephilathites and Nephilites by the Byzantine writers who alone had any information. Yeah, that's really interesting, guys. Okay, so obviously Tartaria was Christian at this point. I wish I had the uh, other thing that I wrote, uh, that I read. The day that Tartaria became Christian. I'll have to dig for it. But well, my buddy Lex strikes again. Love you, Lex. Know ye, O fathers, and many of our fathers. Historian missionaries since the 7th century have gone into the countries of the Mongols and Turks and Chinese and have taught them the gospel. And at the present time, there are many Mongols who are Christians. For many of the sons of the Mongol kings and queens have been baptized and confessed Christ. They have established churches in their military camps and they pay honor to the Christians. And there are among them many who are believers. Travels of Raban Bar Suma. I mean, guys, who were the three wise men that blessed Jesus, the Messiah? Seriously, I believe they're Tartarians or Scythians, you know, at the time. I mean, who else? Why does God have so much love and respect for Israel? You know, he's just like, oh, you guys, I love you guys so much. You know what I mean? Like, seriously, though. Whoa. Okay. But check this one. First, I myself being emperor and lord of the Tartars will be baptized in the faith which the Christians hold to this day washing and advising all my subjects to do the like yet not um, intending to force any there unto so he, he's not going to force them to do it um, to your second we will and agree that there will be a um, perpetual peace between the Christians and the Tartars and the Tartars and the Christians. The matter of the Holy Land, we say that if we could conveniently, we would willingly go thither 
go there in person. Um, for the reverence we bear to our Lord Jesus Christ. But because we have many occasions of importance to stay um, us in these parts, we will take order with our brother um, Haloon for the due accomplishment of that service in all points um, as it bestows for the freeing of the city of um, Jerusalem, so like Jerusalem, Jerusalem, and all the holy land out of the hands of the pagans and restore it to the Christians. There you go, guys. Make sure we take a picture of that too, huh? And then, in this celestial Jerusalem, the word formerly communicated by God to Moses is found. This word is Jehovah, lost on earth, but which he invites us to find in great Tartary. A country still governed, even to this, to, um, even in our days, by the patriarchs, by which he means allegorically to say that this people m uh, most nearly approach to the primitive condition of the perfection of innocence. This is Encyclopedia of Freemasonry of 1916. And then that there were ancient churches in the. Um, Asianic world and that they had a word which was afterwards lost respecting this ancient word which was in Asia before the Israelitish word it is fitting to relate this news that it is still reserved there among the people who dwell in the greater Tartary in great Tartary um, it was made manifest to me from this that the ancient word is still among them that they possess a word and that they had possessed it from ancient times seek for it in china and perhaps you will find it there among the tartars the apocalypse revealed by emmanuel sedensburg of 1766 so interesting guys but yeah i need to make sure i, I take a picture of these ones this time thanks lex there's that tom knoth again and he saving the world from us fairy tale believers well mr knoth how do you like this fairy tale Alphabets of the world. In the various alphabets of the world, the numbers and letters varies from 12 to 202. The shortest alphabet is that of the Sandwich Islands and has 12 letters. The Tartarian, the longest, containing 202 letters. Whoa! 202 letters! Probably the smartest people on the planet. Probably took it over at 1100 AD. Hmm. Yeah, who really believes in fairy tales? Yeah. At this point, it's called denialism. You know nothing about the subject, but you are the greatest authority. There's a lot of them right now. The denialists. Because it makes them feel good. Yeah. Mr. Denialist. Good luck treading water. Attention all denialists. Do you know who you are? Hmm. It's a person who refuses to admit the truth of a concept or proposition that is supported by the majority of scientific or historical evidence. And also, denialism is the practice of denying the existence, truth, and validity of something despite proof or strong evidence that it is real, true, or valid. Despite evidence! But yeah, so they're Christian. They even fought in the Crusades. Wait a minute, fought in the Crusades? That's unbelievable. This is, oh, baloney, baloney. Uh-huh. In the spring of the year 1299, James uh, de Molly, the uh, 22nd of the last Grand Master with the body of a French and English knights, landed at um, Sudia and made a junction with the Tartar forces, which were camped among the ruins of Antioch. The Emperor of Tartary was at... Uh, variants with the Sultan of Egypt and had in, um, invin invited the Templars to join him in an expedition into Palestine. Um, an army of 30,000 men was placed by the Morgul Emperor under the command of de Molay, the Grand Master, and combined forces marched up the valley of um, Orontes towards Damascus. In a great battle fought with Hamas and the troops of the sultans of Damascus and Egypt were entirely defeated and pursued with great slaughter until nightfall. Aleppo, Humas, and uh, Damascus and all of the principal cities surrendered to the victorious arms of the Mongols and the Templars. Once again entering Jerusalem in triumph, visited the Holy Scepter and or Sept 
Scripture and um, celebrated Easter on Mount Zion. Guys, these Mongols are Christian. What? I thought the Mongols didn't have a religion. Wait a minute. Hold up. Yeah. You've been brainwashed. Uh, the combined armies were preparing to march upon Damascus when the sudden illness of um, Kassan was given over by his physicians. Um, just concerned all their arrangements and uh, deprived the Grand Master of his Tartar forces. The Templars were then compelled to retreat to the seacoast and embark their forces on board their galleys. The Grand, Grand Master sailed to the Miso stationed a strong detachment um, of his soldiers on the island of Ardes near Tortosa, uh, which was fortified, but these were speedily attacked in that position by a fleet of 20 um, Egyptian vessels and an army of 10,000 men, and after a gallant defense, they were compelled to abandon their fortifications and were all killed or taken prisoner. Thus ended the Dominion of the Templars in Palestine. That's sad. All right. So, yeah, there you go, guys. Some real history, which, you know, would make a fantastic movie. You know. Ha! You're not going to make a movie. I'll be quiet. Make your mouse. Of course I'm not going to make a movie. You guys are satanic. Ha! How did you find out? Okay. So, anyway, guys. I know. <laughs> That's re really dorky. But, anyway, I know. It's kind of frustrating, though. All this stuff going on. Good versus evil. And... You know what, guys? I believe we are living in Revelation. I really do. I really do. I've been, th uh, you know, thumping hard into the Bible, like really digging, digging deep. And God's been revealing a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff, guys. We've got to get back to the Bible. I found that it's not as altered as I once thought it was. Um, which, you know, whew, feels pretty good. You know, everybody who adds or takes away from these holy scriptures will be hit with the plagues of this book. Well, that's not talking about the whole Bible. That's actually talking about Revelation. If you'd actually read it, it's the book of Revelation. But anyway, so, yeah, don't get me started. And we'll check out this little list I have here. Okay, guys, some little notes here. What we're dealing with in 2023 is the, it's known as the Red Heifer Ceremony. It's where uh, Israel has two red cows. And uh, a certain rabbi had brought red cows over from America and, uh, they had bred them to bring back the red cows because they have a prophecy, you know, a Judean prophecy that uh, once these cows, um, if they stay red for two years and this is the second year, then they will sacrifice it and they will rebuild the Temple of Solomon. Okay, I found this when I searched red heifer sacrifice and I took a picture of it. So the red heifer sacrifice could take, uh, take place in one year. So September 27, 2023. Okay, so... The five red heifers uh, landed in Israel about two weeks ago. Too much fanfare, celebration, end time speculation, and uh, a healthy dose of cynicism as well. The uh, cows have been all been determined um, by have been determined by certain rabbis to be ritually pure for sacrifice. For now, they must stay unblemished. The red in order to be uh, so that they have to stay red in order to be sacrificed. Um, when they are older than two years old. So they were one years old then. So there you go. Older than two, I should say. So yeah, that'll be, I mean, maybe September, 2023. I mean, we'll see guys. And right here, the Messiah, Messiah is coming as real today. 22nd, September, 2022. According to Jewish tradition, the appearance of the hundred percent red cow, which is extremely rare sign of an imminent arrival of the Messiah. All right, let's see who is this Messiah. And so that's one, two, rebuild the Temple of Solomon. So if these cows stay red and they get sacrificed this year, you guys can look it up, the red heifers in Jerusalem and whatnot. Yeah, they'll start rebuilding the Temple of Solomon. So I looked up the Temple of Solomon. It'll take 18 to 36 months to rebuild. So if the red heifer thing goes through, then by 2024 through 2027, uh, we should see the Temple of Solomon being rebuilt or rebuilt by then, about maybe 2025, 2027. The fake alien invasion of 2024. This is a really interesting one. I'll have to show you guys a video of this. World governments attack the people and unite the world. Yeah, through a fake alien invasion using holograms and beam weapons. Formulated the final stage of their sinister plan. 
In the year 2024, a global event will alter the course of mankind's future. The world will stand witness to a massive alien invasion. Thousands of projected holographic alien warships will blanket the skies, sending people into a global panic. Real military crafts within the holograms will inflict actual damage to the surrounding areas to sell the gimmick. And as a result of the ensuing human chaos, a one world government will immediately form without any resistance from the people. They will be the new world order. Once this happens, we as a people will be doomed to enslavement and accelerated depopulation. With that said, the only hope for human salvation is to acquire and spread the knowledge of these activities and agendas. Resist, retaliate, then conquer this imposing enemy. The time is now, as humanity is rapidly approaching its final days. We'll get really exciting. We'll go over that kind of stuff. And if anything, it'll be entertaining. But it'll be very interesting. Three, West destroyed, USA. So the USA gets destroyed 2024 through 2029. Because the rabbis are saying that their Messiah can't return until the West is destroyed. Also, um, the Jewish Messiah is here. We can look him up too. We'll watch some stuff on him too. He's, it's pretty interesting. And so it's very interesting when someone prominent in Israel starts to rise up and is actually accredited with miracles. Yes, this Yanuka Rav Shlomo Yehuda is actually accredited with performing at least five or six miracles that I'll get into here in just a moment. I'll do just a quick overview on this guy for anybody who hasn't heard of him. I learned of him through the channel Wallytron 101. Very grateful for him pointing this guy out because there's extremely strange coincidences surrounding this guy. A lot of characteristics that are similar to what the false prophet will have. So a quick overview on this guy is that he grew up as a Jewish person, obviously, but became extremely proficient in the Torah and the Talmud and all these different Jewish texts, which in itself is a supernatural sign and wonder, really, because it's said by the age of 15 that he was already proficient in the Talmud, which is like hundreds of books. And through his understanding, he's gaining a lot of prominence in Israel. Many of the high level Jewish rabbis and Jewish people are just in awe and going to him for their wisdom and knowledge. So now I'll get into these miracles that he's performed. But first, I need to point out something that needs to be referenced that all of these miracles and I'll leave the videos in the description where you can see what these people's wordage of the miracles are, you know, word for word from their own mouth. Every single one of these people who talk about the miracle that happened to them, not a single one mentioned God. And the miracles that are attributed to the Yunuka is one guy met with the Yunuka, and the Yunuka said that he would meet his soulmate that day, and that very day he met the person who he married. There's another guy who had malignant tumors, and the tumors disappeared after having a conversation, and the Yanuka just said that they would be gone, and they were gone. Another guy was released from prison before the Sabbath, and his wordage for this was that it was not of this world altering the laws of nature. It happened just as the Rav said. And there was one more guy in this video who referenced that he was about to go into surgery. He had to go. It was the day before surgery that he was going in. He met with the Yanuka. And then Yanuka said he'd be healed and he was healed. So pretty shocking to hear. And again, I just have to point out that not a single reference to God was working through him. God healed me through him. Not a single ounce of the glory for these miracles was given to God. It was all given to the Yanuka. And here we have the Yanuka lighting ceremony, Leg Baomer 2022. A lot of weird things happen in this. Um, you know, 
I know, like, if we're dealing with who we think we're dealing with, like the Khazars, I mean, this could have very well been a human sacrifice, too. But, um, you know, like, what's in that fire? And then, like, something weird happens. I mean, um, or they could just be celebrating, right? I mean, let's just keep an open mind and be like, well, maybe they're just celebrating. But, you know, it's hard because, you know, we are living in Revelation, in my opinion. So, just check this out. We Right there, did you catch that guys? Might have to rewind it, I'll show you again. But uh, yeah, I mean, was that somebody giving up the ghost? Somebody's soul going up into heaven. You know, a lot of people, well, that's a demon. That's a, I mean, maybe, but I mean, look at that, guys. That's, that's nuts. And here's another one. I believe this was in Cairo. But yeah, I mean, a lot of people are saying, oh, holograms and stuff like that. But I mean, father of lies, right? And the fourth. In 2030, New World Order, world governments unite, give the power over to the Antichrist, Agenda 2030, Mark of the Beast System instituted. Also in 2030, 42 months or uh, 1,260 days, the two witnesses living in the wilderness and Antichrist reign, Mark of the Beast, beheadings, because of the Beast System. Also in 2030, the remnant Christians live in the wilderness, 1,260 days or 42 months, Christ's return, June, August 2033 or 2024 hey sorry guys a little correction not 2024 2034 i accidentally typed it up wrong uh, i was kind of in a hurry yesterday when i did it but yeah there you go i continue so we'll see we'll see if christ return after that 1260 days and if the 1260 days starts in 2030 so the 42 months or the 1260 days starts when uh the abomination of desolation appears and the man of lawlessness is revealed. That's when it starts. So if that happens in 2030, we've got 1,260 days in the wilderness. And that's only if, only if, you're faithful and Christ is your savior now. The ones that are lukewarm, he spits them out of their mouth. So, yeah. Interesting. But yeah, we'll run through all the Bible for that and stuff like that. And it's going to rock everybody's world. But rest assured, in the end, there's a happy ending. All right, last alterations, um, number three. 
Uh, not Messiah can return. He's already here, as you saw. But no, Messiah can take the throne. So they said they have to destroy the West, the USA, uh, by 2024 through 2029. The reason is because of Agenda 2030. Uh, and by 2030, he's got to take the throne. So there were rabbis that were saying that the West must be destroyed before the Messiah can take the throne, can, you know, take over the earth. That's why they have the New World Order, a one world government, because, uh, and that's why they would have to do something extreme like an alien, a fake alien invasion, because, you know, that way the world will unite, you know, oh no, there's aliens, and then give their power over to the, to the Antichrist, to the beast. So where did the beast come from? Well, there's a reason why. In Revelation, you know, it says that a mountain of fire falls from heaven and with it the key to the bottomless pit or key to the abyss. And uh, that's where Apollyon comes from when it, when it hits and stuff. Well, we have something like that. Uh, Geneva, Switzerland, and CERN, uh, there's a particle accelerator they are nicknaming the key to the abyss. And uh, that's kind of interesting. And then it's got Shiva the Destroyer, which is a, it's a goddess in front of it. And um, so my theory is Apollo is the Antichrist. He comes back as Apollyon the Destroyer because he merges with Shiva. And I believe that's what that's all about. But And we'll see. We'll see. But there are two Antichrists. You know, there's a Antichrist and a false prophet. And so we'll, you know, we'll see which one this Yanuka was and, and if he's the Antichrist or the false prophet or whatnot. Um, but yeah. Like and subscribe to... Uh, quest for tartaria guys and make sure you press the bell for notifications and we'll see you with the next video sergey monast who was a uh, investigative journalist in area of project bluebeam and he had a lot of uh, information inside information on this and they have murdered this man they have murdered him and they have also uh, before they murdered him they have taken his children away so oh, let, let's see what he was saying that will happen. As far as conspiracy theories go, Sergei Manas, Project Bluebeam is out there, way out there. In 1994, Sergei Monas, a writer and investigative journalist from Quebec, published an alleged manifesto. According to Manas, the four-step project designed by NASA and the United Nations would allow these organizations to accomplish what he believed to be their ultimate goal of creating a new age religion led by the Antichrist in order to start a new world order dictatorship. Now, when it says of new age religion, we know that all these religions are coming together now, Steve. Yes. But if you remember Itzhak Shapira, when he was explaining that their Messiah is coming to Jerusalem, he spoke of the new Torah. Do you remember? Yes. He said he's going to give us new Torah and this old law, old Torah and everything will be abolished. Okay. And then he will teach them something completely new. So we not now know that Jews, Muslims, Christians and religions of the world are uniting for the one world religion. Yes. And are. we know that it's all led by United Nations and look, NASA with this project Bluebeam and this um, Sergei Monast was talking exactly about this in 1990s already and he was murdered for it. So NASA would implement project Bluebeam, Monast believe, with a system of advanced mind control as well as top secret technology in order to trick everyone into believing that there have been a second coming of sorts. So the second coming of Christ is going to be faked, Steve. That's they are exactly preparing right. skies for it. Now let's see what the four steps were. That was interesting, kind of. Oh no. The first step of Project Bluebeam would involve manufacture of artificially created earthquakes in strategic locations around the world. And these earthquakes would, according to the conspirators hoaxes, unearth artifacts indicating that the religious doctrines of all nations have been misunderstood for centuries, thus discrediting all religions. Imagine that. Wow. Don't we see earthquakes? So let's see. We don't know if this is going to come true. This is what he claimed based on his inside information. 
Now, it says Manast claimed that movie like 2001's Space Odyssey had already laid the psychological groundwork for this step by presenting stories in which mysterious unearthed objects upend everything humans know about themselves and their world. Okay, so we know there is a lot of predictive programming in movies. Right. The, the second step, yeah. Sergei Manast claimed, would involve a gigantic space show. During this stage of Project Blue Beam, three-dimensional optical holograms as well as laser projections of holographic images would beam across the sky. What would these images include? Projections of Jesus, Muhammad, Buddha, Krishna, etc. will emerge into one monast set. Wow, interesting. And we know that we have chemtrails and a lot of people are saying that these chemtrails have, uh, you know, many reasons why they do it, but one is that they're preparing the skies for something. They're going to mm. do this space show. Interesting, Manas was talking about this as a, a second step. Manas explained the technology behind this display, saying that the conspirators would use space-based laser-generating satellites to project simultaneously images to the four corners of the planet in every language and dialect according to the region. That's interesting because similar thing was in the movie or kind of, it wasn't a movie, it was a series called V, just V, letter V. Remember we watched yes. it? Okay. When the, the, this uh, spacecraft has, you know, appeared in the sky and this face uh, of a woman who was yes. speaking in every language, so... Yeah, like a little series or something, I, yeah, right. I recall that there. As the whole sky is transformed into one massive movie screen, this new uh, god would speak to everyone in their own language. And you're right, that, that uh, somebody be... pointed that out beat to us, and we watched a little bit of it just to get an idea, and that's exactly what they were doing. Next, the third step is where mind control would take center stage. Tele telephonic communication devices would send waves to reach each person within their own minds, convincing each of them that their own God is speaking to them from the very depth of their own soul. Notice it's telephonic communication, so the new 5G technology in your telephone can now, basically, uh, this thing will have the ability to do exactly what skull to brain technology has been doing for some time that the military has used. Yes, and this technology exists. In fact, we talked about this today, Steve, earlier, but uh, I'm afraid that that was in 1990s when he spoke about telephonic communication. How about now injecting inside of people's bodies? Yes, with this new uh, uh, nanotechnology, or excuse me, not yeah, nanotechnology, nanotechnology and hydrogel. but hydrogel, yes, they're going to be able to do that, hook that up to 5G network, and uh, they're going to be able to do some really amazing things. You won't things. even have to have a phone. He, how would these rays be able to reach people's inner minds? Monast explained, such rays from satellites are fed from the memories of computers that have stored massive data about every human on Earth and their languages. The rays will then interlace with the natural thinking to form what we call diffuse artificial thought. Well, there we go, Steve. You remember the young man that they claimed that uh, killed all these students here in Florida in the school shooting? I always suggested that he was a victim of that very technology at the time because he told the police he was hearing voices in his head. Wow. Okay. That's right. And he never said, uh, you know, I mean, literally it sounded like skull to brain technology. And uh, so I, I really just, sus a lot of suspicion on that case there. Finally, the fourth step of Project Bluebeam would make use of various technologies in order to convince people that alien invasions and the rapture itself were taking place, thus making it easier for the powers that be to take control of a fear adult populace. Now, I did hear that it's in the arena of a new world uh, or so-called new age religion where they even released books describing this rapture Steve so there will be they're planning on some kind of a false rapture event so I don't know what everything we're gonna have to go through and see but this is very scary 
the NASA Bluebeam project is the prime directive for the new world order's absolute control over populations of the entire Earth. 